Business of Architecture, episode 307. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's episode is an unscripted conversation with the hosts of the Business of Architecture UK podcast, director of the Business of Architecture UK office, Ryan Willard. In this particular episode, we're going to be talking about money scripts. So without further ado, here is today's show. Hello and welcome, Architect Nation. Enix Sears here, joined today by my co-host, Ryan Willard. And the topic of today, this is actually Business of Architecture Unscripted. It is currently 9.30 p.m. on a Friday night, and we're doing what a couple of guys without much social lives <laughs> and, and do, which is recording a podcast. Fantastic. I and so it. we were having a chat about the topic for today was going to be on money scripts, and we have some very interesting oh. kind of comments that were sent in. Yeah. And we're going to go over. We do, and it's but particularly apt because I just finished my interview with um, Dr. Brad Klonst, who was a money psychologist and was talking about how money scripts dictate our relationship to finances and our ability to build wealth. Um, and we were looking at some of the mythologies that are often revered in the architectural industry of famous but broke architects from Frank Lloyd Wright, who famously would like to sort of give away his money in order to kind of um, create a kind of creative fervor because he worked better. I, I need to get some buildings done immediately. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> the pressure is on. Exactly. <laughs> I work better when broke to Louis Kahn as well. So we, we have to be responsible that in the industry and in our education, there is a glamorization of the broke architect. Interesting. And that, that's the kind of narrative that we we adopt. And it kind of subconsciously, we end up associating, well, if you're getting paid well, then you must be doing bad work. Podcast listeners, what do you think? Is this is this true? Do you, do you agree that there is a glamorization of the broke architect? I know that one of the kind of comedic releases I usually do when I'm doing like a live presentation, for instance, I've got him up on stage and stuff. I'll, I'll sometimes say, you know, kind of telling my story, how I got into architecture. I said, of course. And then I went to architecture school because I, I, I knew that architects made so much money. And of course, everyone in the audience laughs. <laughs> so there must be some truth to that. If if it's funny enough to laugh at it when I say that you know, we're in it for the money, uh, there must be a, must be something there. It's interesting as well. I remember when I first started university, uh the tutors saying we're often we're often given this narrative of like architecture is a vocation and it's a calling and it calls you and that we don't do it for the money and i remember that almost like day one or two there was an actually an explicit conversation about you know you're about to embark on this journey you guys don't really know anything about architecture you don't really know why you're here but it's going to take this incredibly long period of time and then you're going to work in a profession where typically you won't get paid but and this is the big but there is the kind of what we're doing is noble it's and important it's important which it is i'm not i'm not i'm not dismissing that and you know i'm a lover of architecture and architectural process and an advocate for the power of buildings for society and the power of architectural thinking um but we just have to be responsible for that it's often attached with those other narratives around money and you know how do we reconcile a passion or a craft or an art or something that we give our heart to with commerce and we we were talking before about we kind of had this shared thing where i started architecture school because of the the idea of social impact i wanted to do something that wasn't just a nine to five job. So I was totally disenchanted with the idea of going to work just for money. And in my mind, I thought that pretty much every other profession, they were just in it for the money and people just hated their jobs. You know, as, as a youth, as a teenager, I looked around the people that I saw and just thought, wow, their lives just look miserable. Just doing what they hate just so they can bring home a paycheck. I'm going to do something different. 
and I considered being an artist, but I said, you know what, I don't want to, I don't want to be that different. <laughs> I actually want to, I actually <laughs> want to raise much. a family. <laughs> I actually want to have a paycheck. So I thought, you know what, architecture is probably a nice, a nice medium there where you can actually, it's a profession, you can earn a salary, but at the same time, it's not all about the money. I'll be able to do something that I'm passionate about, that I love. And yeah, money was definitely not on the top of the list of why I was doing it. But what was interesting is my perception of what other people got out of their jobs it was very cynical it was very superior as a matter of fact like i kind of viewed myself as morally or intellectually superior to all these other uh, the unhappy masses who were out there grinding away at the slave wheel while i was pursuing this noble profession of architecture and eschewing money you know saying well money's not the most important thing i'm going to go do something i'm passionate about and whatever money comes along to support my lifestyle at least i'm doing something i love interesting it's quite judgmental in a way I, I, I've had very similar judgments of other people. I, mean, I remember at university, again, kind of holding myself to a, a, a sort of standard of like, well, at least I'm doing something that's A, benefiting society and is my passion. And that's the most important thing. And, you know, people who are just working jobs just to get a paycheck, uh, you know, and and also the the yeah the arrogance of thinking that other people don't enjoy their jobs as well or thinking that i know what other people's jobs are even are, even about yeah and thinking thinking they i mean i i honestly thought the the only reason they're doing it is because they chose the road where they wanted to go for safety and security and money instead of creative expression so it's just inherently in that there's a judgment that i was having against all these other people and it wasn't until i started to make this transition into business of architecture and getting out of professional services being my primary form of income, mm -hmm. that I suddenly understood that there's so much creative expression in so many different professions. I, I actually, right now, I actually view architecture as, as a field, anyways, for me that isn't as creative. Now, having said that, it probably depends on what role you're playing in what kind of firm, because there's some architects, like I would say, in my perception of the industry, there's maybe. 3% who are on the design teams of, of large firms, those guys and ladies have charmed lives. I've kind of interned at one of those firms once. It's absolutely fun. You get a sketch all day long. You're doing renderings. It's everything you thought architecture would be. You're just doing the design, and then you hand it down to the second floor peons who are going to crank out the construction documents. But realistically, over my career, I was never on just a design team where that's all we did because you need to have a large firm to do that, right? So you have, because design is only maybe 5% of a project when you look at the total lifespan. And so you need to have quite a number of projects and team members and flow of projects to be able to have five people exclusively on design 24-7. And so my reality as an architect, of course, was reflected ceiling plans, figuring out how the tile was going to lay out in the shower, right? Making sure that the turning radius of the toilet and the, you know, the toilet didn't go into the ADA turning radius and trying to figure out everything about fire rated corridors. And it was very different. You know, so there's the amount of creativity there, right? I, I, I tried to get the joy out of the creativity of drawing little details or, you know, making making that column plan detail, you know, kind of where the metal studs go. So there's little puzzles, but to me, the actual practice of architecture as a whole, in terms of what I was doing at a smaller firm, it was very dry and it was it was difficult to get through the day because I just didn't feel like my creative juices were being challenged and stimulated mm -hmm. enough. That's very very interesting, and I'm sure an experience that lots of people can relate to. Um, again, I had a, a similar sort of experience, went to university, in, intensely creative experience at university, where you were really allowed to go off onto wild, divergent patterns of thought and creative ideas and all that kind of stuff. And then the real world of architecture, I found very different to that starkly different like almost unrecognizable and you you went to the bartlett yes right which is a very theoretical very high on the theory side in yeah. terms of the their academic education yes and of course I, I went to cornell in the u.s which is kind of sounds very similar but it's very much on it's all about the theory of architecture yeah the speculation what architecture could be which is a fascinating conversation and again like you know what we do with business of architecture i think that is this is a valid practice of architecture just in a totally different way well that that's interesting because when i when i finally began to glimpse 
what other the joy and satisfaction other people could get from the process of creation. I suddenly began to understand that everyone in whatever field they're in, as long as they're in something that, that gives them joy and passion, they have creative moments all the time. They can experience that. It doesn't need to be art. It doesn't need to be sketching. It doesn't need to be creating a chipboard model or doing some rendering, this sort of visual creative. Now, of course, that's highly rewarding. Of course, I know how it feels when you look at a building that you helped design and that you were a part of that process. That is an, a huge payoff. What I found, however, is that in my case, the payoff didn't come quick enough. It's mm-hmm. like you might work on a project for four or five months, six months, a year even before you get that payoff. Whereas, for instance, I, I dabbled in web design and I was like, yeah, I can right, get right, that right. payoff in three days. Yeah. Like, this is amazing. Yeah. You know, and so that kind of opened my mind to, to say, you know what? There are other creative professions out there. We get these creative endeavors where people are able to, to experience that same. You know, that same creative process, yeah, I guess, I, just in a different way. I, I think it's very uh, blinkered to think that the arts are where creativity lies. I think that's a real big misnomer. Um, I mean, it's we can kind of see it at the higher levels of science and mathematics. That's a very That becomes a very creative endeavor. You need leaps of intuition and creative thinking to be able to solve complex problems. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, I find for me personally, and I've, you know, I've been in an avant-garde architectural school. I've been in an avant-garde rock band that was a very highly specialized form of self-expression that was very creative. And actually running a business is, if not more creative than either of those. I agree. And that's the the passion and, I have for business now is because business what i found with the actual practice of architecture now i'm I'm excluding the design teams i think design teams are very similar to a school environment Mm. if you're just designing all the time that can be highly creative and highly rewarding in the sense that i thought architecture was right however with with the actual practice of architecture where you're, you're taking into account all the variables that need to happen in a project whether it's codes fire ratings officials the budgets for the projects, everything, you know, just the details, the CAD drawings, the very nitty-gritty, the engineering, coordinating with the MEP guys, making sure that the outlets are in the right spots, everything like that, right? Making You're going down the checklist of equipment, making sure it's the right voltage and the right place and everything, yeah, yeah. right? These things, they can, they can be very dry. I mean, let, let's face it, they, they, <laughs> to put it lightly, they, they can be very, very dry. No. I know. No. I know it's, Window schedule dry? It's, it's, it's hard to believe. of creativity. Uh, now, door schedules, don't even get me started. Do you, do you like door schedules? I mean, going, going, making sure the door schedule match. Even when we use Revit, where everything's supposed to be automatic, I mean, you still have to go through and make sure you have the right passage set on the right door, you know, oh. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it's it's the kind of the things you end up doing in architectural practice or the sort of large monotonous tasks that can happen. And also the kind of constant iteration of various things that might not actually seem like it can be very sort of minuscule, particularly on large infrastructure projects. So I worked in some big practices where uh, we were doing lots of large infrastructure scale projects that moves at even a slower pace. Uh, and again, I think it's a kind of personality thing as well, like how quickly you want to see something resolved. But that said, I, I mean, I worked at Rogers on numerous competition entries. In fact, that was my sort of role. And I'd often be dropped into uh, a team and, you know, do little hand sketches and the colourful, pretty pictures and all that kind of stuff. And within those tasks, there's quite a lot of creativity. Um, but again, I, I, I think when you compare it to business and particularly even the the creative side of designing your own business and i think at the business of architecture what we're passionate about is seeing your business as something that is a creative alive element expression yeah. a creative expression of your ideals exactly and it's the, that is the generator of all of your architectural ideas and it is design and it's the most important design because it's where all other design takes place. So to be able to be masterful at all the different components and understand it and structure it and kind of treat it like an architectural project in itself where you've, you've got a kind of overarching vision for where it's going, what it's doing, all the different parts of it, and then all the different mechanisms inside of it. Some of them are financial. Okay, it's hard to be creative with 
with spreadsheets as to a de- you know uh, if you just do- outsource that if, if you're just bookkeepers yeah, are for if you're just accounts. doing bookkeeping like that's like the least creative element to it however the way that you earn money the way that you think about money which um the balance sheets and profit and loss sheets become a sort of reflection of can be very creative the sort of deals that you're you're working on the communication internally is massively creative marketing my goodness i think marketing is like the most innovative and creative industry that exists yeah pretty much you you were, you were telling me about the book alchemy by Put Rory Sutherland. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Rory Sutherland is the vice president of uh, Ogilvy in the UK. And he talks about kind of logic and psychologic. And he talks about how human beings make decisions based on the emotional, instinctual drivers of the brain and then post rationalize with, you know, logic. And so the emotional and the, uh, and the instinctual logic is kind of in, you know personalized to the individual and that's what he calls psychologic and within that psychologic is where marketers can play it's where you can craft messages it's where you can start being really really super creative to start making magic as he calls it happen he was saying in the worlds of physics and structure it's difficult to make magic happen it's difficult to make a building float for example but within the world of perception um, and how things appear, that's where like magic can actually, actually happen and you can completely transform um, a, a customer experience through being very thoughtful. Um, a good example of that, for example, is um, they did some work on, with TFL, uh, which is the Transport for London, and they wanted to improve their customer experience. And TFL were thinking about enlarging the carriages, making the tracks better, bigger uh you know so they could increase capacity for people so they could get more customers on the train um you know they were thinking about improving other types of services the the thermal conditions in the summertime under the tunnels all these really expensive solutions and ogilvy suggested well one thing that you could do that would totally transform the customer experience is to have timetables or to have um, the time displays up on the tracks like every single platform you go to is that what those are yeah so it, <laughs> it tells you this train is coming and it tells you the time so it says three minutes to the next train yeah that's fantastic because they discovered that the most frustrating part of waiting for a train was not knowing when it was going to come so it's this kind of that for me is design it's creative and it's kind of you know it's part of the world of marketing and perception and uh, is where a lot of this creative joy in business can come because when you get to start to craft your message and you start to understand what's happening in the experience of your customers and your the people that you're working with, this is where you can start to improvise and draw upon a real richness of ideas from all sorts of different sources, which is, you know, it's, it's an art. It's definitely an art. And, you know, speaking of architecture, it, it does have, there's a lot of constraints around, like, archi- much, ar- many pieces of architecture, they're very formulaic, very formulaic, they're a kit of parts. I mean, 5 8 inch shipboard over sheet metal studs, you know, you have your 16 gauge sheet metal studs, your 14 gauge or whatever, the, your, your 18 gauge, you know, for a strip center, you know, you know how your plaster details are going to work, you know, what kind of, you know, you're just pulling out the same details and it's just like a kit of parts that you're putting together. And so it's interesting that architecture, there's so many constraints on the practice of architecture now, as I mentioned before, everything from codes to the, the limitations of building technology. Yeah. Right. To the stakeholders that have budgets and things like that. Right. So it's very constrained. However, going back to this idea of business and designing business, what I love about the game of business is that there are no, there are no limits. Yeah. It's a limit. It's, it's an open canvas. Yeah. There's no one telling you that you have to do it this way as long as you're within the bounds of the law. Yeah. And now, you know, as long as you're doing some, you know, yeah, not, you know, then, then all's fair game. Yeah. Right. As long as you're you're operating within the limits that society has established for commerce and capital, you can you can create your own future. And that that's that's to me that's a huge canvas to play upon. That's mm. pretty exciting. And some firms are playing in that in that canvas. I think you know, big out of uh, 
out of Denmark. Of course, they have offices all over the world, uh, but they're doing some very interesting things in their business model, kind of really playing the way Bjarke Ingels, you know, you'll see him on Instagram. It just seems like he's constantly traveling around, like going to fun, fun, like he's at Burning Man one week, and the next week he's in, he's in Austin, Texas, you know, but the kind of work they're doing and the way they're kind of his approach to being more radical about the practice of architecture and the business of architecture is very interesting. Uh, so going back to that idea of creative expression, it is interesting that my mind was open to entrepreneurship to me is one of the most creative fields out there. Yeah. Just creating something out of thin air, bringing together resources, mobilizing team members. And this is almost an added joy or outlet that architects can have once they apply their design thinking to their business. Yes. Yeah. And totally. that's what our message is here, right? Yeah, and I, I love what you just said there about the definition of an entrepreneur is somebody who brings together different resources and kind of combines it in a new way. That, for me, is like, that's what architects do. It's what we do when we're designing a building. We're kind of bringing together different ideas from the client, from the constraints, from the, from the site, from our own experiences, and we're bringing it together in a new building system. We're designing a system, essentially, and that's what architecture is. And when you're designing a business, you're designing systems. And you're bringing together these different resources and you're creating something which has got a new value to it. And th this is the magic as well. And when we start realizing that's what, we're, that's what you're doing as an entrepreneur, it's again, it's like it's play. It's yeah. so playful and it's so creative and you can just do so many different things. I, I often hear, um, I mean, I love property and I love the property world and kind of fell in love with a lot of property uh, people's way of thinking about business because they're so creative with the way that deals get done. They're so creative with the way that they find finance for a project. And there's this kind of performance element to it as well. Like, you know, sometimes the the solution can be something so simple, but we might not do it because of our own internal mental blocks. Just for like, for example, raising money is basically asking somebody for money you are asking another human being for money now in that very simple request which sounds easy enough to say is a whole world of emotion of fear anxieties worries thoughts and this is why most businesses at some point or when you're looking for money have problems because there's some difficulty around making that request like how do you make that request how do you communicate it how do you um, provide it so it's landing of value to the other person and the property world gets very very creative in the way that they structure those conversations the way that they play with those conversations the way that they you know when you hear developers often they don't often sometimes they don't put any of their own money down into a deal they're using other people's money. So this is this those kind of dirty developers, Ryan. Nasty. Are you people. holding them up to be an example here? Uh, these the horrible capitalists. <laughs> I know. What are you talking these horrible about? Horrible capitalists. Capitalist dogs. But when we start taking an appreciation for the creativity that resides in how property deals and financing is structured, I think we can relate to it as architects as being another another art and it also gives us a, a way to start communicating the value that we have as designers um to start bringing that into the conversation and we can start we can start doing the same thing uh with our own fees and this is you know some of the most inspiring business owners i've spoken to architects recently uh they've been very creative with the way that they've structured their fees the way that they've um approached their value proposition to their clients so rather than the kind of exchanging time for money, which is, which is so, it's so uninventive. 1980s. I mean, let's yeah. just face it, Ryan, it's just 1980s. Like, it's medieval. Medieval. That's <laughs> even better. It's really, really old school. There's nothing wrong with it. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. Excuse like, me? It's, it's, just, it's just an old fashioned way. It's not how people are getting rich in the world. Um, if your goal is to get rich, Ryan. And what if your goal is not to get rich? Well, the question would be, what is your goal? And what is your vision? 
And would money and having more of it facilitate that vision to happen faster,、ah. more effectively, and have more deeper, widening impact? This is the question. I think it kind of links into the email that you had. Yeah, let's、recently. leave let's leave him on that cliffhanger. Yeah, this will be this. We will, we're going to continue this episode,、uh, but we did get some hate mail. So our next episode. <laughs> <laughs> Now, when you're a public figure, let me just put this out there: when you become a public figure. And you know we are public figures, just huge public figures, as I'm sure you know. It's、yeah. difficult to walk around London. It is at the moment <laughs> with the with the flocks of、yeah. fans. Of course, for... of course.、Uh, but you you know even with our minor celebrity status that we have, we have attracted our fair share of hate mail. So in the following episode, we're going to go over two examples of one was literally hate mail, the other one was more of a comment that kind of illustrated some an architect's mindset about some of the content that I had shared. Uh, but it would definitely be count in the criticism category. So that's your cliffhanger,、uh, cliffhanger for today, and、uh, we'll we'll get onto that in the next episode. Sounds、okay. good, Ryan. Sounds brilliant. And that's a wrap. If you haven't already, make sure you get access to my free video course that reveals the roadmap to building a practice that is dependable, rewarding, delivers an exceptional experience for you, your staff, and clients. Is autonomous, meaning that it can run without your constant input. And last but not least, has a powerful mission and purpose. Go to dreampracticewebinar.com to access this free video course. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.